But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Dear faithful in Christ, when we hear about the charisms of the early church, raising the dead to life, healing lepers, casting out devils, taking up poison and drinking it, not being harmed, taking up serpents, speaking in tongues. When we hear these things, we are drawn to them and fascinated by them. But there's a temptation to think that, well, if I really had the Spirit, I would be able to do these things as well. The truth is that these extraordinary charisms were given to the early church very generously by our blessed Lord and by the Holy Ghost because the church at that time needed to spread to all regions of the world. She needed extra graces, extra helps to allow that spread. And so yes, those were extraordinary things that our Lord gave to the apostles. But the truth is that he has given us something which for our salvation is more beneficial and more powerful for our everyday lives. Those extraordinary graces were given for the spread of the church. What we receive at baptism and further at confirmation is given for our salvation, for our sanctification. I speak of the gifts of the Holy Ghost and the fruits of the Holy Ghost. It's true that at baptism we receive God's sanctifying grace for the first time, but we receive a whole pile of other things, including these gifts and fruits. We receive the theological virtues, faith, hope, and charity. We receive the Beatitudes, which help us to suffer persecution for justice sake and for being mindful of the poor and the meek and the humble. But it is the Holy Ghost whose feast it is today that gives us these things. The Feast of Pentecost comes from the word for 50 because the Israelites for 50 days after they crossed the Red Sea wandered in the desert. And on the 50th day, God gave them the Ten Commandments through Moses. After our 50 days of Easter, we celebrate the new Pentecost. Except this time we are not given the law on tablets, but we are given God himself in our hearts in the Holy Ghost. In this Pentecost, we recall the words of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Do not err, he said, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor the effeminate, nor liars with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor railers, nor extortioners, shall possess the kingdom of God. After St. Paul goes through and talks about many of the sins that will keep us from heaven, he immediately goes on to say, and some of this you were. We were those things. We did those things. Some of them and other things, some worse. But now he says, you are washed. You are sanctified. How is it that we could have done these things and been these things, but now we are washed? He says in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it is the Holy Ghost that that holy name sends to us to wash us, to strengthen us, to, put, to help us put these things behind us. And so... Our Lord paid the price for those things that we did and that we were 
maybe not exactly those specific things, but many like them, some worse. But he did not abandon us. Ten days ago he ascended into heaven. But all along he was promising that he would send a helper, who he called the paraclete, the advocate, to be with us. So that although physically he would be absent from us, he would be there spiritually at all times in the church, in the Holy Ghost. And the truth is that physically too, at every Mass, we have our Lord's body with us again. So it is the Holy Ghost and these gifts that allow us to overcome our sins, to be washed from them, and to avoid them in the future. Now what is it exactly that we receive at baptism and in a greater way at confirmation? Well, as I mentioned, the theological virtues, the Beatitudes, many moral virtues, things that help us to please God, things like piety and patriotism, obedience, liberality, patience, chastity, all of these things we get a confirmation. And as long as our souls are in the state of grace, they are with us. But we also get the crowning jewels of the Holy Ghost. His seven gifts, or sometimes we say his sevenfold gift, a jewel that has seven facets to it. And that is the seven gifts of the Holy Ghost. Wisdom, understanding, counsel, fortitude, knowledge, piety, and fear of the Lord. These seven gifts are really seven powers or seven sources of energy or seven helps which enter into our soul through sanctifying grace. It is our cooperation with those gifts that put them into action. But they also have to be stirred into action by the Holy Ghost himself. We have to ask for those gifts to be stirred up. When they do, they help us become more alert and more ready to know and to do the will of God. The seven gifts of the Holy Ghost help us, we could say, to catch the breath of the Holy Ghost. We could think of our soul like a ship, and the seven gifts are like seven sails that catch the wind of the Holy Ghost and move our soul much farther and much faster than we could by doing the laborious rowing ourselves, which is what we often do. We don't ask God to stir up those gifts, and then we wonder why it's so difficult, and why everything moves along so slowly, and why we don't get very far in the spiritual life. A sailor who only put up his sails at Christmas and Easter, or maybe once a month, or even every couple of weeks, would not be a very good sailor. He wouldn't get very far. wouldn't even get out of the port. He would put up his sails every day and catch as much of the wind as possible. And this is what our blessed Lord invites us to do. More than invites, really commands us to do. He says, I have sent the Helper he is there for the asking. But you have to ask. And we forget. But the gifts of the Holy Ghost are great, great powers that each of us who is baptized has, and those of us who are confirmed have in a very full and strong way. The power of the Holy Ghost, which our ship catches by unfolding those sails, by asking every day, enables us to do even things that are humanly impossible. It is these gifts of the Holy Ghost 
in the souls of the saints that explain how they could do things that we wonder, was it possible? How was it possible? Wisdom, fortitude, piety, fear of the Lord, all of these things to help us not only in our spiritual life, but in our everyday life. In the Old Testament, the tongue offended God, the human race, murmured and complained, and then later plotted and schemed and connived to build Babylon, a tower so great that they could reach the heavens. Their pride swelled up and they thought that they could walk up to God, that they could, through their finite human powers, reach the infinite. And so our Lord sent tongues among them, different languages, so they could suddenly no longer understand each other. And their plan was confounded when they couldn't communicate. But after our Lord paid the price for our sins and promised to send the Holy Ghost, it was a tongue that healed our sin. The Holy Ghost came in the form of tongues over the apostles and the others gathered in the upper room as a sign from our Almighty God that now the wound was healed and no longer would tongues divide the human race but now the human race would once again be united through the Holy Ghost who came in the forms of tongues in the form of tongues on that first Pentecost but who has remained with us each day in the church And who is in our soul, as long as we maintain that grace, or if we've lost it through mortal sin, get it back through confession. And if that's the case, then my friends, we have powers in our soul that we barely tap, but which our Lord is begging us to ask for, to be stirred up. Because he kept his promise in sending the Holy Ghost. And his Father is a Father who keeps his promises. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.